Hey everyone, Robert here, and this is part one of building your own pocket platform. What is a pocket platform and why would you want to build one? Well, that begins with your idea. Let's assume that you have a web-based business that you'd like to launch. The first step is to determine whether your idea is worth building. In other words, whether users are actually going to want to use it. And as intuitive as that might sound, that's actually a very difficult step. There's a lot that's been written about it. For example, Eric Rice in The Lean Startup suggests that you should be showing this software to your potential users early and often, often before you think it's ready. And that way you can build up a feedback loop that hopefully gets you closer and closer to what's called product market fit. Peter Thiel, one of the creators of PayPal, wrote a book that covers a similar topic called Zero to One. And he says that a successful business is actually broken up into two distinct phases, the zero to one phase and the one to many phase. And the zero to one phase is all about proving the value of the idea. The one to many phase is taking a valuable idea and scaling it up to serve more users. And on the right, we have Paul Graham from Y Combinator. And he's here because he wrote an essay on a similar topic called Do Things That Don't Scale. And in there, he cautions against this temptation to start focusing on scalability first, this assumption that your idea is so good that it will become the next Facebook, the next Google, the next Amazon. The truth is that most ideas fail. They fail for various reasons. And that's why it's so important to focus on the usefulness of the product, finding customers that it delights as early as often. So. All three of these books, they touch on this theme that you should be focusing on iterating toward mar product market fit before worrying about scalability. All right then, what does infrastructure look like during the zero to one phase? Well, we now know that infrastructure at this phase should be optimizing for proving that the idea is valuable. In that case, here are some of my requirements. It has to be simple, so in other words, if I look at it, I need to be able to understand it. It needs to be flexible. This is related to being simple because I need to be able to change it. As I'm building out the product, getting feedback from my customers, ideally I'm taking that and making meaningful changes, getting closer to something that they love, and so it needs to be flexible. It needs to be valuable. I should set the expectation that in the beginning the business is not going to be instantly profitable. It's not going to pay for itself, certainly, and I'm having to pay for it out of pocket somehow or I'm going to have to borrow money to do it. And I want to make that cost as low as possible while delivering all the features that I need. It needs to be on demand. There's no way I can wait to order hardware, rack it and stack it, and then f pay some fixed cost and some long-term contract. And this is also related to flexibility. And finally, here's one that I think is often overlooked. It needs to be fun. A lot of these side projects, they're done um, while you have a day job, while you're moonlighting or it's a side project that you're doing with a friend. And if it's not fun, after a day of work, you might be exhausted. The last thing you want to do is deal with a bunch of infrastructure that is just going to get in the way, that you feel like slows you down or it's repetitive or it's error prone. Uh, the less fun it is, the less vulnerable you are to just say, ah, screw it, I'll get to it tomorrow or I'll do it later and you decide to watch TV instead. So uh, making it fun is very important for sustaining any side project. So from these, we can describe a couple of functional requirements. Again, it's a web-based project. None of this should be surprising, really. It needs to have uh, DNS functionality so that we can resolve the domain we choose to the set of backing services. It needs to have SSL and this is both for security and for search engine optimization. And as well as uh, SSL is a requirement for building things like GitHub webhooks, Alexa skills, progressive web apps. It needs to have subdomain routing. So for example, if you've registered domain.com for your project, you might have something like blog.domain.com, about.domain.com, contact.domain.com, shopping.domain.com, and you want those to be able to route to their respective services. And the next two are kind of nice to have. This first one is an SSL proxy to localhost. This is, of course, related to the SSL requirement. 
And this one is a little bit more specific. So let's say you're building a progressive web app. If you read the documentation on progressive web apps, they require an SSL endpoint for the service worker. And so if you're building and deploying this thing on localhost, it's actually really annoying to test with any number of different devices. Um, and a lot of de developers work around this by using a SSL reverse proxy like ngrok or Servio. And that's great, but then that has the problem of spreading your DNS settings across multiple different services. So that kind of um, goes against this simplicity non-functional requirement we had earlier. So this is nice to have, and I can show you later how this can be done very easily. And then lastly, automatic deployments. Um, everybody's workflow looks a little bit different, but after you're, you've been developing, your dev test cycle on localhost is complete. You have some changes you like. What happens next? Usually, there's you run some unit tests, you run some integration tests, you commit it, and then that pipeline kicks in, and then later on a deployment uh, occurs. And that needs to be automated because if you're going in there and manually doing it every time, it gets old fast, and it's also very error prone, which makes everything less fun. Nobody likes repeating the same thing over and over again with the high risk of making mistakes. So automatic deployments. These last two again are not strictly necessary, but I think they go a long way toward making the project sustainable and uh, reduce the amount of repetitive work. Okay, before I start building the Pocket platform, let me quickly go over the tools that we're going to use. So I'm gonna be using a Windows 10 machine here. And if you're a longtime Windows user, you may have encountered a lot of frustration with trying to uh, have a Unix-like environment and I think there's a good solution now. We have this uh, tool called WSL, which stands for Windows Subsystem for Linux. And after that was released, there's this neat project called WSL Terminal. And that's what I'm using for this demo. And I'll include a link in the description. As for the editor, I'm using Visual Studio Code. And if you want Visual Studio to behave the way that it does in the rest of the demo, then you can pause it here and install the same extensions that I have. Of course, if you have your own, then definitely use a tool or an editor that you're most comfortable with. All right, let's start building our infrastructure. And to do this, we're going to use a service called Amazon LightSail. In order to use LightSail, you're going to need to create an AWS account. Once you've created your account, log in, and then under find services in your management console type LightSail. That will take you to the LightSail console. And from here, we're going to be able to manage our instances, network settings, DNS, etc. Now I mentioned that LightSail is nearly perfect for building this kind of pocket platform. And that's true. There's just one missing feature I wish they would add, which is domain registration. Let me buy my domain through LightSail. But hopefully that feature is coming quickly in the, in, in the future. In the meantime, we're going to have to transfer the, we're going to have to point the name servers for our domain in our domain registration service to LightSail, and then we can manage those domain server, the domain name entries inside LightSail itself. So let's get started. Uh, once you're in LightSail, click on networking. And the first thing we're going to do is click create a static IP address. The reason we're going to create a static IP address is that we want to point our DNS settings, our, our DNS uh, a records to the static IP address instead of a dynamic IP address in case our virtual machine needs to be reconfigured, changes IP address, whatever. And we do this because DNS propagation is kind of unpredictable and it can take a long time and it varies for users across the world. So we do this so that everybody trying to resolve the domain will get the same static IP address and we can eliminate a source of frustration. So first, again, networking, click create static IP address. And here I'm just going to give it a name that I can remember. And there we go. This is now our static IP address. This is not going to change and I can attach this to any new instance that I spin up within LightSail. Now the next step is to come back into networking and then click create DNS zone. And here it tells you to enter the domain that you've registered. For example, it points you to route 53. And the domain that I've registered for the remainder of the project is raccoon.news which is your source for all raccoon-related news. 
I told you proving your idea was good is important. Once you've done that, click create DNS zone. And once the DNS zone is created, now we need to add a couple of A records. So click this add record here. And an A record is a kind of DNS record stands for address. And it basically points something dot raccoon news dot raccoon dot news to some IP address. So for the IP address, we want to point it to the static IP that we created earlier. And here it tells me if I put in the at symbol, it's going to point the default domain to this IP address. So I'll click accept now. And then I'm also going to come in here and click and add any subdomain will point to this address and then click accept. Now the last step is that these name servers need to be entered into the domain registration service. And that is Route 53. I purchased this domain through Route 53. So now I need to go and edit the settings in Route 53 and make sure that the name server entries there point to LightSail by specifying these addresses. So let me take this first one. And if I flip over here, I'm already logged into Route 53. Oh, another point here. When you purchase a domain specifically through Route 53, it's going to create a default hosted zone for you. And it's easy to make this mistake. It's easy to come in here and say, oh, I know what to do. I'm just gonna click on the hosted zone, click on my domain name, and then now I can edit these NS records and I can paste this entire block of name server entries over into here. Very tempting, but that's not gonna get you what you want. What you actually want to do is come back into the, whoops, if you come back into the dashboard, you actually want to click hosted zone and you want to delete this entire hosted zone because we're not using it anymore. In fact, every entry that we're going to be entering here is going to be specified in light sale and we want that to be the definitive uh, set of records. So just delete this hosted zone. You're not going to need it. And then back in the dashboard, you click on domains, click on the domain that you're using and then you click add or edit name servers. And then you need to replace these entries with the entries from raccoon.news. Right, so this, if you've ever done, uh, if you ever created a GitHub page, this flow is very familiar to you. So you just got to come in here and paste these. One by one. And then you click update. Now this is going to take a little while. And as soon as it's done, it's going to send you an email. So I'm going to fast forward the video and I'll be back when the process is complete. After your name server changes have taken effect, you should be able to ping the domain and see it resolve to the static IP address. Now, depending on the domain name registration service that you're using, you this may take a couple minutes, this may take a couple hours, it all depends. But in the case of using Route 53 and LightSail together, I found it to be extremely responsive. It usually takes only a few minutes and then I get the email that I've changed my domain name settings, or my name server settings. So I can come into the terminal now and I can say ping raccoon.news. And indeed, this is resolving to 3.224.225, which is the static IP address that we created earlier. Now it's not responding because that IP address is not actually backed by a virtual machine yet. So nobody's picking up the phone, but we know the phone number. In the next video, we will get set up with the environment so that we can actually respond to requests at this IP address.